Hi, this is Natalie Lander, voice of Kinsey, Tara Branford, Stargirl, and many others. You are listening to a W2Mnet podcast. You can visit W2Mnet.com for other podcasts about entertainment, video games, sports, and wrestling. And live from Niagara Falls. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it is too late at night to be doing this. Oh, my God. Welcome to... I, I, this is going to be a train wreck. The kickoff officially after dark as we are recording <laughs> at 12.45 a.m. Saturday morning here in order to bring you guys a show for Wild Card Weekend. Good evening, afternoon, whenever you're listening, and God help you if you are. I am your host. My name is Harry Broaders. You, you, you forgot me. something, Harry. What did what, I forget? What is, the, what, what is this episode? It's our wild card preview edition. It, there's a certain uh, number we're on. Is that, is that seriously this one? I thought no. it was. Isn't no, that what I, we talked about? Or did we miss one? They got pushed back because we missed week 16, remember? Okay. Never mind. That's that's Eric's gig is this next our week. Is this the first 69th Next week is... Giggity, literally, giggity. next... Next week is episode 69. All right. Anyway, this is the kickoff after dark, officially. Slab, slab, slippity slab. I'm your host. My name is Harry Broadhurst. I'm not sure I really want to claim this episode, but here we go. Joining me, as per <laughs> usual, the executive producer turned co-host, Eric Watkins. This ain't going to be a family show, and next week won't be either. You've been <laughs> warned. Yeah, Viewer discretion strongly advised next week. The oh, co-host, <laughs> the co-host turned executive producer turned co-host. Fix your goddamn computer, Brandon Biscobing. It will be fixed next week, and I will also have a soundboard. So we will be very, uh, we will be, we will be saying very good next week. Do we seriously need to tell Eric we have a soundboard going into episode 69, Giggity? <laughs> yeah, Brandon, we, yeah. we're going to have, have a conversation about that. Yeah, I, I got I feel, ideas. <laughs> I, feel like the, I feel like the backing music for Eric when he does the intro next week is going to be the theme from Debbie Does Dallas. Well, <laughs> something maybe a little more bass guitar. I haven't quite decided yet. Eric will have this all masterminded. And finally, the fourth man, the chairman of the W2M Network, Jason Teasley. Um, I'm reporting live from Niagara Falls where it's wet and wild. And we'll be here for about two hours. <laughs> the views and opinions of Jason never fuck it. <laughs> it's, almost one, it's almost one o'clock in the morning. We this is we missed a week so yeah we got to get through this uh i'm going to try to cut down on the shenanigans but uh no promises yeah not to mention i've got shout outs at the end of the episode and i'm yeah oh. anybody know how expensive flights are to stockholm i'm asking for a friend I don't that's know if, that's if, if all shores are golden i'm friend <laughs> Try that again, Jason. I'm just wondering if all showers are golden. <laughs> no, no, normally there's an extra fee with those. Uh, I'd family show, but at this point, what's the point? All right, let's move on. <laughs> we open the show how we normally do with studs and duds. Eric, your stud. We are the Dolphins, Miami Dolphins. Yes, for the journeyman. Hmm? You are the Dolphins number one? I actually remember that song. <laughs> for the journeyman quarterback who has the second most legitimate children in the NFL behind Phillip Rivers, a man who I'm pretty sure has now done this feat with every other team in that division. Yes, he and has. He has officially beaten every team as the quarterback of that team in the AFC East. Yes, 
Fitzmagic himself leading the four-win Dolphins to an incredible upset victory against the New England Patriots. Of course, Week 17, this time in Foxborough, no less. And, the, you know, how can I say this? To the delight of fans everywhere, to the point to where they better be getting gift baskets and extra you know, dollar shooting guns when they're at the club for this week. Yeah, Patriots no longer have a first round bye. They'll be playing on Wild Card Weekend for the first time in a decade. For those mighty men, you are all my studs. Twas glory. Not only that, not only will they be playing on the Wild Card Weekend for the first time in a decade, they actually have a very difficult matchup in what is likely to be inclement weather in New England this sun, this Saturday on in Foxborough. Oh, we'll be talking about that even more because there are plot twists. Stay tuned. Dun, dun, dun. Dramatic (laughs) reverb. Yes. Is that light light nipple twists? Purple nurples? No, this this is more... No, this is more like, will you get the shocker? Will you not? Stay tuned. (laughs) And by that, he means... Shower? Never mind. (laughs) <laughs> Brandon Stud. <laughs> My stud for the week overall is the Clemson Tigers for pulling off the upset and coming back, coming from behind and winning uh, the, the semifinal game against Ohio State. But a secondary stud along the lines with that game is the linebacker who made the tackle at the two-yard, or I think it was more like the one-yard line, to basically save the game for the Tigers towards the end of that game. So you're backing away from your original stud, which I would have taken if I would have known. No, I I, I also right. took it. I, I took the same stud. I took the stud. Mm, no. no. You t- Bisco going to Bisco already. Your you, your original stud was number forty seven for the forty niners, Barnwell, who had the game st- the game saving tackle against the tight end for the Seahawks on Sunday night football. It was number fifty seven Greenlaw, actually. Oh, okay. It's one AM in the morning, Eric. I don't expect myself to be competent. It was number sixty nine Boucher. <laughs> well, in fairness, the tight end did say something bad about his mama. <laughs> Captain of the you know, he didn't pull a Tim Crumry in that situation. Jason Stud, uh, my stud is um is going to be going from stud to dud in in about four months. Um, cool Joe Burrow coming. Off his uh, Heisman win, went for. Now get this: this is re- this is some ridiculous numbers. Twenty nine of thirty nine passing, for four hundred and ninety three yards and seven touchdowns. As the Bayou Bengals totally bit smack the Oklahoma Sooners. I mean, if anybody has any doubt about uh, Joe Burrow. Being the best quarterback in college football, I mean, he, I mean, he put all his naysayers away. Now, the reason why I said he's going to go from stud to dud is the Bengals do have their first overall pick, and all signs and, point to the that he's becoming uh, Andy Dalton's successor. Well, I do believe over the last couple of weeks we had dubbed the phrase "bungling for Burrow" here on the show. Mm-hmm. P- pretty mm-hmm. much. Not to mention, he also had a touchdown run in that game. But if the Bengals want to do something right, and they're the only Ohio professional football franchise that seems to even (laughs) want to half the time, then they'll bring along his offensive coordinator, Joe Brady, with him to Cincinnati. Well, to be fair, out of the 39 attempts, he was only sacked one time the entire game. Can I point out the fact, too, that like 350 and five of those touchdowns came in the first half as well? 
Oh, no. His first half numbers were 21 of 27 for 403 yards and all seven of his touchdown passes. Wait, all seven of them were in the first half? I turned the game off once it was like 35 to 14. Yes, they were up 49-14 at the half. Oof. So the Pac-12 is saying, we could have lost like that just as easily. <laughs> well, I mean, it takes a lot of skill to lose 63-28. I'm just saying. But Oklahoma's used to this. Okay, so I'm going to stay in the same conference and give credit to a team I don't usually give credit to for my stud for the week. You ready for this one, Eric? I got a stat for you. I am listening. Going into the Gator Bowl, the Tax Slayer Gator Bowl, teams trailing by double digits with four minutes or less in the game this season were 0 and 471 in the NCAA this year. Mm, I thought it was 13 with five minutes left. My point being <laughs> is that. It is now 1 and 471. Congratulations to the Tennessee Volunteers as they rally from a 22 to 9 deficit to take down the Indiana Hoosiers to win the Tax Slayer Gator Bowl 23-22. Yes, I'm giving credit to Tennessee. No, don't get used to it. Hashtag FRT. And if you don't know what that stands for, you're clearly not a Florida Gator fan. So so that was the battle of the basketball schools. I pretty much. And it was here in Jacksonville. So I <laughs> and, and, and it's a low key shout out to Robert Foster because, you know, he is probably the only Tennessee uh, volunteer fan in, in existence that I know of. Make sure you guys check out Golden Point Sports when you get a chance. All right, let's move on. Flip the script here, Eric Dud. How do you have a kicker who makes six field goals? You as a team score 39 points. You're all hyped up after a pretty significant couple of weeks to end your season, and you lose. Memphis, yes, you went up against a pretty top-notch Power 5 school in Penn State. Yes, you actually gave them a great game for most of that Cotton Bowl, but um, what happened? Just really well, the last, I would say, 20 minutes of the game, just what happened? Really? Well, I, could, I could argue that a lot of that for Memphis had to do with losing their head coach like a week before the game. Yeah, but even still, you had the whole grandeur. You introduced the new head coach in the locker room. Blah, blah, blah. You keep the train rolling, yada, yada, yada. You're still my duds. Hell, look at what happened with Baylor. They kept their head coach, and how well did that work? Ugga gonna ugga. (laughs) Branded. Get on those fuckers. (laughs) Branded dud. My dud is uh, is Oklahoma for completely blowing the opportunity and just fat, flat out crapping the bed against LSU. Oh, uh, so you mean the game we already talked about. Well, no, we Jason, we, we <laughs> someone talked about, but yeah, I, I'm going on the flip side. I, I, Hasn't it been a long standing rule? Hasn't it been a long standing rule on this show that you can't take both sides of the same game? Yeah, and, I, and I've been I've been chastised many times while trying. Yeah. So while Brandon thinks of a different dud, <laughs> Jason, um, my dud is a is is a really ironic dud. Uh, ESPN has a show named after him uh, called 30 for 30 uh, mm-hmm. and that's Jameis Winston but <laughs> I want to go out on I'm going to go out and even turn the knife on him a little more I've used him as my dad I've used him as my stud but I mean did you guys see how savage Bruce Arians was to him when asked <laughs> with any any 
sit down interview, Arians said with another quarterback, oh yeah, if we can win with this one, we can definitely win with another one too. Yeah, he yeah. also said that at the post game like press conference. What if I told yeah. you you could be well, second I, in NFL and touchdown passes, throw a franchise record for passing yards in a season? It, and like, still is it, not is it, is it like they're only like that? Eric, this is something for you. Uh, I know you're Mr. Statistician. Statistician. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Isn't isn't there like a elite number of quarterbacks that have thrown over five thousand yards in a season, and most of them are Hall of Famers? You're actually correct. Winston is now the eighth quarterback ever to throw for 5,000 yards in a season, and this was only the 12th occurrence in NFL history. Most of the others are either are or will be Hall of Famers, minus Matt Stafford. All uh, all this really says about the Buccaneers is that they had zero run game this year, so they had to completely rely on Jameis Winston throwing the ball. But even still, 5,109 passing yards. Franchise record, career high, obviously. 33 touchdown passes. Second in the NFL to Lamar Jackson's 36. 30 interceptions. Even if you have a run, even without a run game, if you have a quarterback that can complete those first two levels of statistics, you're going to do a lot better than 7-9 and nine most of the time. Again, unless you're Matt Stafford, but that's beside the point. Real quick here, let's talk about that last part of that stat line, though, and the fact that that 30th interception ended up costing Tampa Bay the game against Atlanta, causing them to finish third in the NFC South this year. Oh, and what could be extremely wonderful in a full circle moment? James Winston's first ever pass as a Buccaneer, his first in the NFL, was a pick six. What could be his last pass? As a Tampa Bay Buccaneer, a pick well, six was pick six. I don't think he goes anywhere else because, I mean, unless unless you're a seller, unless you're a middle of the pack team that doesn't have that great of a draft pick, so therefore you're not going to get a top notch college quarterback. I don't see anyone taking the risk on them unless they have a a stout offensive line. I'm going to give you two two teams right now that I see and mark this down that I'm making this prediction. Ginger Domus is about to speak. Uh Uh-oh. I look for one of these two teams to at least inquire about Winston's ability. One being the Chargers. The other being the Detroit Lions. Oh, the Chargers are actually looking to go after a much bigger fish. The Lions, however, I can see a little bit in that. Because yeah, the NFL Lions I can see. seven pick sixes in a season aside, yeah, they're not going to be able to rely on a guy like David Blau in case yeah. Stafford gets hurt again. Well, I mean, here's the thing, um, though. Who... What other quarterbacks are going to be free agents this season? Believe it or not. With all due respect, guys, this would probably be a conversation for when we have a little bit more time and in sure. order to continue the idea behind these quarterback changes. True. But it's not, these okay. people ain't ready for the news with Tom Brady, so you continue. <laughs> all right. Um, just... Brandon, did you find an alternative dud? And I swear to God, if you take mine, I'm going to punch you in the balls. Well, why don't you go first? Just <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, at, at this point, it's zero fucks given as the, even as the Because host. also, plus mine kind of, if mine is available, mine kind of segues into uh, our So That Happens stuff. All right. Um, my Metro official boot? dud. Hey. Hey, um, Eric, what if I told you that there was a team that not only blew an entire conference's chance to make it to the college football playoff, but then that same team 
proceeded to get run in its bowl game. Oh boy. I, I yeah. Yeah. I think I know where you're going. It's, as soon as my my browser reloads like it's supposed to, congratulations, Utah, you dumbasses. Not only do they get run out of the Pac-12 title game by Oregon, which, by the way, yours truly called in advance. How's it feel, Ginger Domus? I can do it, too. <laughs> Not to mention, I even mentioned them having a sniff at the playoff, I think, in one of our preview shows. <laughs> Hi, Texas. Bye, Utah. How in the hell do you let Texas, who went 8-4 and four this year, and most of that not great because of that 8-4? That, that and four? That was after a three and zero non conference start. Or excuse me, no, they started two and one non conference because they lost to LSU. But still, how did you get run by Texas? Okay, was it that game in Texas? Okay, but Utah, you can't deny that Utah was clearly clearly the superior team according to the polls here. Utah okay. was ranked. Utah was ranked eleventh. Texas was not ranked. Yeah, but when you're a whole bunch of Mormons traveling down to a middle of nowhere to play a bunch of, you're surrounded by like Baptists and things, you're going to be out of your element. Is that what it was? They were surrounded by steers and Christians. <laughs> that would that that would be my guess if I had to defend them. <laughs> the views and opinions of Harry Broadhurst do not necessarily anyway. <laughs> Bisco, what do you got for us? Um, so what if I told you that a, a incredibly overhyped team had an incredibly fitting end to the, their season and got their coach fired in the process? Okay, to be fair, that incredibly overhyped coach should have never been the coach in the first place, but I digress. No, I didn't say the coach was overhyped. I said the team was overhyped this season. The coach was overhyped, too, but continue. Browns are going to Browns. They lose to the Bungles in the final week of the season and in the process get Freddie Kitchen fired. Okay. Hey, here's my, here's are we, my are we early Bisco in, Bisco in? Hey, hey, real quick. Hey, did Jason, did you send those Cleveland Browns AFC North Championship T-shirts <laughs> down to Africa what? yet? I heard they were winning. Well, actually. Actually, actually, they went to Zimbabwe. Um, that's in uh, Africa. The, uh, that is in uh, Africa. That's an African country, dude. <laughs> hey, look, I, I don't like to, you know, I like to give them the proper due respect, sir. <laughs> you know, not, I just lump everybody together. Just because all of you guys look alike don't mean a damn thing, okay? <laughs> okay. Hey, Eric, you know, I like, I like my diversity. Eric. Yes. I will say that here on the kickoff, we bless the rains down in Africa. Do, 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 do. Well, we always do things that, that something a hundred men or more could never do. So it fits. Uh, too easy. Too easy. <laughs> no. I'm, I'm not, but but I just like how Eric Eric tried to Eric, Eric tried to get me, and I had a, a nice little comeback for him, and kind of popped him a little bit. But um, just pointing out, you know, the fact that we are discussing um, kitchens a little bit later. Um, Bisco's going to Bisco. Yeah, no, I said that was a great segue because now we're going to talk about the coaching carousel. Yeah, in order to kind of um, streamline tonight's episode of the show due to the fact that we have games to get to and we have I'm a Survivor to run down throughout the course of the year, plus, again, limited timing for tonight. Our so that happened is going to focus on the coaching carousel that has happened through Black Monday here in the NFL. And the very first coach who we found the fate of was that of Freddie Kitchens, Jason. Yeah. Um, let's, let's just say uh, with that much talent on that team and you, you got that much hype surrounding you and you have absolutely no control of the team. You have 
two premier wide receivers, um, and I think they combined for maybe six touchdowns on the year. <clears throat> um, and, you know, as much as Odell Beckham hated New York, it was so high, hyped to get out saying that, you know, he couldn't deal with Eli Manning throwing the ball. Uh, I'm I'm really sure that uh, if he was stayed in New York and had Daniel Jones throwing the ball, he would be a lot more happy than you know realizing that Baker Mayfield wasn't all he's cracked up to be. Um, <clears throat> that team has way too much talent on it for uh, any coach to really fail there and not at least go 500. Uh, I'm pretty sure that you know us four could go in and. Uh, be a coaching staff and at least win as many games as Freddie Kitchen did this year. So, I mean, uh, I'm curious who Cleveland's going to bring in because you're going to have to have a really strong uh, coach to handle all the egos in that locker room and the commander respect. So this is one I'm really keeping an eye on to see who's going to replace Kitchens. And naturally, in Brown's fashion, they're going to hire the coach first and then the general manager. Yeah, I was just about to talk about that and the fact that John Dorsey's out in Cleveland as well, which I think is a mistake. Not really. I I thought I I read that wrong earlier when I was on break at work. I thought I'd just seen that wrong, and my brain just kind of did its dyslexia thing. But, yeah, then reading that while while I was fixing some pizza rolls here, that is one of the most ludicrous things ever. Uh, okay. You're talking about an owner, Jimmy Haslam. Number one, he's a big booster for the University of Tennessee. Dumbass. He, exactly. <laughs> so now, just in his brief ownership of the Browns, through head coach, general manager, executive, you lump all those together. In what was it, the past seven or now eight years since 2012? 25. 25 total changes. 10 alone as a head coach. Okay, so I'm going to make a bold prediction here. And I think that If they get this right, they could potentially help turn this organization around here because I think the hire for this organization is obvious. And if they hire who I think they're going to hire, I would not be surprised to see them hire him as the GM as well. Does the name Mike McCarthy mean anything to you guys? Mm. I've heard that, and I figure if you give him Uh, G powers, that could work. But he'd have to have a hell of a staff. I don't see it happening. Reason why is a position that we're getting ready to talk about when Bisco comes up. So because he is the front runner and looks to be named at this place. Well, we might as well move over to that position now. Eric, I need you to answer that question in the group chat. Brandon, for the second time in three years, your New York football giants are looking for a new head coach as Pat Shermer is out in New York. Yeah, Sh- Pat Shermer fired at the end of the season. I understand it to an to an extent. He went seven and he went seven and twenty five uh, in his two seasons. So yeah, it's not great. It's not very good at all. Um, I'm kind of surprised. Especially with the rookie quarterback, they that they didn't give him a little more leeway and gave him another year. But like Jason said, Mike Mike McCarthy is a you know a big candidate for the job. And if 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 McCarthy decides to take the job, I'd be perfectly fine with that. He had success in Green Bay. He's a known entity in the NFL. I think he could. I mean, it's not going to be an automatic thing for the Giants. Uh, but I think he could turn turn the team around it, if given the right pieces to play with. One other guy that I I would have I wouldn't have minded seeing in New York, however, is someone else that we're about to talk to or talk about. Actually, we're going to head down to the Big D. Therefore, Eric's <laughs> segue. <laughs> 
No, oh, I was trying to segue you you into yours. Hey, no, no. no. Because you call the big day. I haven't had any complaints, so there. We're going to save. We're going to save the redacteds for last. Eric, Jason, Garrett. Just because is, you said the big D, does not mean it automatically goes to Eric. Okay, that's a myth. That's a stereotypical myth. No, it isn't. Jason, eat your goddamn pizza rolls and shut the hell up. And believe Eric, me, there are plenty of ladies who have plenty of pictures that can attest to the veracity of that statement. Nevertheless, I shall continue. Okay, as I was about to say, <laughs> clap on, clap off in Dallas as Jason Garrett has been informed by the organization that his services as the head coach of the Dallas football franchise are no longer required. Exactly. It was about 10 years ago the Cowboys decided to clap on, pretty much setting Jason Garrett up to be the head coach and former quarterback, former assistant, elevating him to the position. And finally, after another mediocre decade, they decided to clap off. I mean, yes, you can all say with the 16th pick in the 2020 NFL draft, the Dallas Cowboys have gone eight and eight because really it's applicable. Again, this is what the Cowboys do. And the fact that even if they had made the playoffs, they weren't going to come close to replicating their small modicum of success they had last year. They weren't going to make a run. We all knew that it was pretty much time. Jerry Jones has gotten slightly less ornery. He's actually started to take a step back and let his children run a little bit more of the team. And he's flat out said he's getting old and he wants another ring. And this just wasn't going to cut it. Frankly, it was about time. Now, if only another um, non-football based owner would do the same. The fuck are you talking about? Oh, you know exactly what I'm talking about. No, I really don't because it's like one in the morning and I'm half asleep. Uh, uh, the the other uh, show that we used to do, the other uh, sport that we watch. Eh, he's got the XFL to focus on. Exactly. So this is a perfect time. Yeah, uh, yeah there's actually a lawsuit about that, but yeah. that's something for another day. That would probably be something that would. Did, did he touch another child? Did he talk to another child at the B-dubs? <laughs> Jesus. Anyway, back to the show at hand here. So, hey, I, I got a question for you guys. What do Jay Gruden, Bill Shanahan, and Ron Rivera all have in common? They work for a man who can't get a holiday right at a press conference? They're white coaches you know, for the most racist team in the NFL. Hey, Brandon, would you like to pile on here? Because I have one for you as well. Um, I got nothing. They can all three have been introduced as the 2019 head coach of the Washington Redacteds. Wait, excuse me? Jason, uh, excuse not Jason, I'm thinking of Jason Garrett again. Jay Gruden got fired week seven. Bill Shanahan took over as the interim coach and made it to the end of the season, but was more or less informed well in advance that his services would not be kept after the year. Carolina decides to fire Ron Rivera the Monday, or a couple of weeks before the season ends, and in a somewhat smart move by Daniel Snyder, disturbing as it may be to give him credit for anything, Washington has hired Ron Rivera as their new head coach already. It's yeah, smart, yeah. smart for Dan Snyder, but Ron yeah. Rivera is already thinking, <laughs> boy, is this a mistake. Yeah, especially considering um, the attitude problem he has to deal with uh, in Washington, With uh, especially considering what he's most well known for being a coach of. The Panthers? No, in terms of position. Defense? Uh, I, was I, thought he, I thought he was more of a quarterback coach. Oh, Ron Rivera? Oh, no. Okay. no. No, no, no. And that's another thing of the problem. How are you going to go from having, for the bulk of your tenure, Cam Newton, 
and not being able to maximize him getting yeah. the right personnel and scheme. Now you're going to Dwayne Haskins. Yeah, Who you're having to, him to deal Harvard? with his attitude. I'm yeah. gonna tell you. I'm gonna tell you guys right now. Even going into the season, Dwayne Haskins' days in Washington are numbered already. I mean, yeah. kudos to hiring Jack Del Rio as your DC. That was a good call, but you're only fixing part of half of the problem. I, I think that I think that is probably one of lo- looking back on it. Even maybe even next year or the year after next. I think the Giants deciding to go with Daniel Jones over Haskins has to be one of the smartest, most surprising moves in the NFL draft in a long time. I would just say luckiest. Well, I mean, I I honestly think that uh, John Mara had some sort of information and or Dave Gettleman had some sort of information either through their interview or through some other channel that told them that this kid isn't ready. Man, I'm not even sure how Dave Gettleman still has a job. Well, I mean, especially it's not even, oh, Dwayne Haskins isn't ready. It's Eli Manning told him, you're going to get this guy, and they listened to him. Mm Mm-hmm. All right, let's move on here. Um, A quick recap here. I'm a survivor ends with the regular season. Therefore, Jason. Yes. You will be carrying a nine-game winning streak into next year. (sighs) How sweet it is to be Ginger Dumas. Brandon, you know, I would ask, that streak would have been a lot longer if it wasn't for a certain person's team that really fucked me like I was a dirty cum guzzling whore. Okay, maybe I should take away this instead, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> uh, th- three in a row going into next year. Mm. Okay, although okay. technically. Technically speaking, that third one came by the skin of your ass, thanks to Atlanta and Tampa Bay. This is why sometimes you don't shave your anal hair. Thank you very much. <laughs> 1 a.m. in the morning, ladies and gentlemen. Actually closer to 1.30 now. <laughs> uh, Brandon, the AFC East screwed both of us. New England decided to take the game off against Miami. Buffalo really took the game off against the Jets. Yeah, they did. I'm not going to complain, though. My bills are postseason bound. We'll talk about that here in a few moments. Before we do that, let's quickly run down our predictions from the New Year's Six. And for those wondering, we will be making national championship predictions, but we will be doing that next week during the divisional round because the game's the 13th. Why is there a two week? Why is there a sixteen day delay between the semifinals and the championship game? Because the semifinals were originally scheduled this year on New Year's Eve, and the rule is the national championship game is on the first Monday that at least one full week after the semifinals. However, because of a forty percent drop in ratings when previous semifinal games have been played on New Year's Eve, ESPN felt it would make more sense to push the games back a few days to more of a weekend slot, especially since New Year's Eve was in the middle of the week, to accommodate and hopefully get better ratings, which to some bit of success. But since they made this decision too late, they could not move the national championship game back to January 6th, which would have fit the criteria. So this year we are stuck with it. In a couple of years' time, I believe 2023, 2024, when the games are again on the 27th and 28th, the national championship game would be in its proper place January 6th. The whole thing is confusing with the 16-day layoff, but like I said, we'll get to the championship game there. Yeah. I can trust, promise you, trust me when I say it's only a one-off. I I can promise you this, guys. The Tigers will win. <laughs> Thank I don't, you very much, Captain Obvious. <laughs> and remember, folks, you can save more using Hotels.com, even their app. <laughs> oh, are we sponsored now? What the fuck was that, Eric? 
<laughs> Look, just because it's one thirty on a Friday night does not mean my desire for being a potential corporate shill has not waned. What, what what's the old joke I've used many times on this show? I cannot be bought. I how I ever I can, however, be rented. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right, let's get that's to the start. That's, that's the motto of most of Eric's dates. <laughs> hey, they come in reasonable prices. I mean, even The Rock said, if it drives, flies, or fucks, rent it. <laughs> America. Anyway, let's move on. All right. We now reach the wild card playoff preview section of the show here. And. Well, one of our teams made the playoffs this year. They also happened to be screwed by the National Football League and thrown into the Saturday 4.30 on the ESPN spot. Does that mean Penguins can't fight? Does this really surprise you? No, it doesn't. Fuck you, Roger. Anyway, the ESPN ABC simulcast at 4.30 on Saturday will be the Buffalo Bills plus two and a half against the Houston Texans. I saw two and a half on ESPN. Eric, is that number still correct? Yes, it is. Yeah, uh, going because going by the greatest online sports book known as FanDuel, where there are more ways to win, the line is staying at two and a half. Cannot be bought, can be rented. Moving on here. We're picking the game against the spread, and I want your marquee talking point for the game. Eric, we'll start with you. Well, I have to say. As much as the fond memories of the Bills traveling on the road to an AFC South team only to get their hopes dashed vehemently in a defensive struggle, I don't see that happening again this year. And believe it or not, as a part of a certain group of like-minded people that I now find myself in, we discussed this game in depth. Harry... You will be yeah. glad. You will be glad to know we placed multiple bets on the Buffalo Bills. Personally, okay, your I betting percentage. Your betting percentage this year hasn't been the greatest, so I'm not sure how confident <laughs> I feel about that. <laughs> but no, no, my betting percentage on upsets, significant upsets, by the rules of the show is very, very meager. If you were to look at my Yahoo, where I picked just about every game against the spread, including those that were lined smaller than three, I am at nearly 60%. Hmm. Yes. That's, that's not a good number. What? I mean, it's 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 Vegas appropriate. I mean, usually Vegas, anything, anything less than, what is it, anything... Under 65 is a money-back guarantee? Well, usually if you're a professional and you're a sharp, you want to hit 58 to 60% of the time. <clears throat> so he's he's within his range. Mm-hmm. And with this, I even teased the lines a couple of points to give Buffalo a bigger advantage. I'm sorry, even with the return of J.J. Watt, I think he's really going to be on a snap count, much as we've seen before with teams in their first game back from injury. And with Buffalo and their overall defensive performance the first half of this, or really throughout the entirety of the season, I think they're going to be able to contain Deshaun Watson a bit better. They're going to dictate the tempo in the trenches. And even though Josh Allen is making his playoff debut, let's Quarterbacks making their playoff debut in Buffalo, you've got a pretty low bar. And I think Josh Allen will exceed that with flying colors. <clears throat> I mean, he can't score fewer than three. Well, I guess technically he could if we get shut out, but I don't think that's going to happen. Relax. He's not the Interceptacon. You'll be able to. <laughs> that's fair. Jason, what do you think is the big marquee point for this game, and who's your pick? Uh, I'm, I, I, I hate the Bills because they have cost me a a len, even lengthier um, run in my dominance of the are you, uh, I'm a survivor over you guys. Uh, but, you know, this is their chance to win me back. I think um, 
it's going to be a defensive struggle for Houston to move the ball against a very stout Buffalo defense who has come into their own. Uh, I think Josh Allen's going to make a few uh, key plays, but I want to actually predict the MVP of the game. I'll give it. I'll, I'll use the MVP of the game. It's going to be Singletary, who's going to rush for over a hundred yards and two scores. So you're taking Buffalo plus the two and a half. Yes. And Brandon. oh, go ahead. So th- th- throwing my you know my ginger Thomas out that the key that Singletary is going to have over a hundred yards and two touchdowns. Brandon, your key to the game and who you think is going to win. My key to the game is going to be Josh Allen and his lack of playoff experience. And I think he's going to get a little shell-shocked. Yes, the fact that this is not one of the marquee games may help a little bit. But it's his first playoff game. And therefore, I think he's going to show a little... uh, Rookie problems in that department, and I, I'm taking the Titans or the Texans rather. Sorry. And if you have rookie problems, check out fourhims.com where you can find a wonderful select. Never mind. <laughs> See, this is I was the kind of say blue chew. <laughs> <laughs> Six of one, half a dozen of the other. See, this is the kind of production value that we could provide your company here. Get a hold of us. <laughs> exactly, Roman. We can do ads for you, too, now. You won't be left out. Eagle at yahoo.com. Or if it's hate mail, s.garmer at (laughs) (laughs) gmail.com. Copy back in the shower. Wasn't me. (laughs) All right. So you guys are focusing solely on the offensive side of things for Buffalo. I don't think that's the key to this game. I think the key to this game is solely in the hands of number 27 for Buffalo. I think that our all-pro cornerback has got to have the game of his career Mm -hmm. because he is going to be matched up against the best player in this game, and that would be DeAndre Hopkins. I am, of course, referring to one Tredavious White. Buffalo's defense has been stout all season, fourth in the NFL in average yards allowed per game. Pretty sure I said the same thing just without the stat, but continue. You, you and let I me... said Houston's going to have problems moving the ball. May I finish, please? It is going to be a turnover war. In my opinion, it is like I believe Eric did say it is going to be a very low scoring game. Hammer the under hammer the under. And And I can still get good teases on some alternate spreads. Bills plus three and a half bills minus two and a half. You can make some good coin, especially if you also tease the money line. But anyway, I digress. If, if Tredavious White shuts down DeAndre Hopkins, Buffalo's front four will shut down the Houston running game, and Josh Allen will do enough for the Buffalo Bills to pick up their first playoff victory since 1995. I am officially picking my Bills in this contest. Wow, I'm the only one taking the Texans? Yeah, Yeah. you have fun on that island. I mean, to, to to be fair, Eric, he took the Titans originally. <laughs> yeah, but he wouldn't be on an island with that one. Speaking of which, segue. Eric, it is 8 o'clock on uh, 8.15, technically, on CBS, as Jim Nance and Tony Romo have the call when the Tennessee Titans travel to Foxborough to play the New England Patriots. The line is New England minus five and a half, and in a somewhat ironic twist to the situation, Winter Storm Henry, both literally and figuratively, rolling through Foxborough this we- this weekend. And would you believe that Saturday is Derrick Henry's birthday? Hmm. 
Of course it is. Look, if for those of you who believe in omens and portents and signs, that's one thing. But I'm telling you this right now. Derrick Henry snatched the NFL rushing title, and then in the second half of that game against Houston, he literally ran with it as he finished with, what, about 200 yards? Pretty much, yeah, pretty much putting it away. Am I saying he's going to do the same thing in the words of one chiseled Adonis? Absolutely not. However, if you take Derrick Henry by himself versus the running back duo with the Patriots, Henry's got the advantage. If you're looking at offensive line play, Titans have the advantage. And if you're even looking at defenses, New England does have an advantage. But if you look over the past really third of the season with Tom Brady and the offensive performance declining, that Patriots defense has gotten tired. They have let opponents sustain a lot of drives. And if you're talking these abject crap conditions, the Titans really have the best weapons for that particular game plan. Tannehill is going to probably do some will do something that he's never done before. I think he's going to do like with Josh Allen enough to manage that game. I'm picking Titans. And guess what? Not just covering. I've got money down on the money line and a couple of other alternate spreads. Face it, Boston fans, the dynasty is dead. All right, I'm going to go next here just because I have to disagree with you, Eric. Okay, state your case. I've got my uh, table. I've got my sign. I've got my light blue sweater. I've got my cup of whatever beverage I choose. Change my mind. All right, first of all here, I will agree with you that things are not the same in Foxborough as they were. Mm -hmm. The New England dynasty that has traditionally ran through November and December contests went three and three over the final six games of the season this year. The offense, which has traditionally been one of the better offenses in the NFL, is middle of the pack, and Brady has struggled terribly. We brought up the Mitchell Trubisky comparisons two weeks ago here on this very show. That being said... This is January football. This is an overwhelming experience advantage. And this is first time head coach in a postseason game. Well, technically it's the second because he was the coach last year as well. But Mike Vrabel taking on arguably the most tenured coach in postseason history in Bill Belichick. Belichick does not lose to assistants. Brable. Oh, he's technic he wasn't an assistant. Former player. Difference. But I think that Belichick is going to be able to understand the Brable the Vrabel scheme. I think that Brady is going to do enough. And another game that I think comes down to a defensive struggle could potentially come down to a kicking game. And regardless of New England's struggles at that position this year, I do feel like the New England special teams gives the Patriots a slight advantage. I'm, I, uh, so again, game. you're we're saying this game, we're pick, real, real quick, we're picking this game against the spread. Uh huh. I'm taking Tennessee against the spread. Because I think it'll be a very close game. But I just don't see Belichick losing in Foxborough in the postseason. I'm taking taking New England straight up. And I give you that. But I'm just keeping in mind. There's a reason his record in wildcard weekend, same as Tom Brady's, very, very shaky. Also... Steven Goskowski is still out, correct? Yes, he's on the OR. Their kicker is uh, Luke Folk. Mick Folk. Oh, Nick, Nick Folk. Oh, yeah. 
not yeah. form, formerly of the Jets. So yeah. basically, so basically, there's a Nick Foles, and I'm and a pretty Luke sure Foles. he's not. I'm, and I'm pretty sure he's not at the OR. He's at the. He's on the hour. Well, he might be in the OR. You never know. Wait, no, he's he already went through that surgery. At least I think. But Continue. anyway, yeah. So you're telling me in a kicking situation. You would trust Nick Folk. Just wanted to get this on record. I would I trust mean, he him. He wasn't terrible in New York. I would um, trust him more are than we the, for, are, are we forgetting Tampa Bay? I would trust him more than I would trust the carousel of kickers in Tennessee this year between Ryan Suckup, uh, Cairo Santos, and God, there's like at least two other kickers that they played. New this England's year. used four, and again, the Nick Folk, not just New York, Tampa Bay, and even his stint in what was the AAF. That Nick Folk, again, just for the record, you were saying you would trust him. Yes, yes, more than I, more than I trust Greg Joseph. Yes. Okay, continue. Jason, New England minus five and a half. I'm taking New England straight up. You can't count Brady out. Can't count Belichick out. Belichick's been uh, spotted um, as a groundskeeper at New England's practice facilities. And um, I I think that it's going to be a defensive game. And I hope Derrick Henry breaks his goddamn neck. Because he cost me a fantasy football championship and almost uh, $400 by saying that his hamstring hurt and he didn't play. So I had to pick up some like four string practice squad rookie that got me 1.8 points. I ended up losing by three points. Fuck you, Derrick Henry. You used to be a beast in the second half of the season. Now you're just a bitch. And these kind of conversations could be heard on fantasy football to the. Oh, never mind. Yeah, and not to mention, didn't you win another fantasy football championship in another league that I'm in? So hush. Hmm. <sighs> All right, Brandon, you're up. Um, yeah, Eric, sorry, you're going to be on an island on this one. Um, well, technically you- speaking, I'm officially taking Tennessee because oh, I, don't, okay. I, I don't think that New England covers. I just think that they win. Okay, um, but yeah, no matter how much it looks like, oh, the dynasty is over, all of that, you can never bet against the Patriots when it comes to the playoffs. Um, playoffs? We're talking yes. about playoffs? Yes, yes, we're talking about playoffs. Playoffs. And there, no matter how... Bad it looks in Foxborough. They always seem to find a way to win. Yes, I know they haven't been the greatest in wildcard games. Yes, I know all of that stuff. But also, you you have to take into consideration. And yes, I know all the players from Tennessee have come from different areas. I'm sure they've played in those conditions in the past. But... Time and time again, you see when teams from the southern part of the U.S. that don't always get the cold weather go up and play in these kinds of conditions, they struggle. It gets cold in Tennessee, though. Eh, It gets cold, but not to the level that they're going to have to deal with when they're in Foxborough. Not that kind of type of snow, not those types of conditions. That's fair. That's fair. So, especially if the the storm hits tomorrow and it is coming down hard, <laughs> they're they're going to struggle. I'm taking the I'm taking the Patriots against the spread. I think they figure out some way they'll figure out a way to win this game. Oh, I just had a flashback to an interesting time I've had with a redhead. 
I told you not to talk about that on air. <laughs> did did we lose Harry? <laughs> no, I think oh, he's just. Yeah. I, I'm mu- I was I was muted. I'm sorry. It's almost two a.m. in the morning, and I'm like half asleep over here. I'm trying to get through the rest of the show. Let's let's continue here. Let's talk about longtime punching bag of the show, Kurt Cousins, shall we? Oh God. Only because we have to. Sunday at 1 o'clock on Fox, Joe Buck, Troy Aikman have the call. As the Minnesota Vikings are seven and a half point underdogs heading to New Orleans in the return match of the Minnesota Miracle. Jason? Yes. I'm here. Present. New Orleans is going to bitch smack uh, the Vikings, and um, no pass interference calls will be had. And I predict New Orleans by two touchdowns. And Drew Brees is going to have an amazing game, uh, converting for over 325 yards and two touchdowns to Michael Thomas. Michael Thomas, one of only two unanimous All-Pro selections to the All-Pro team this year. The only other unanimous All-Pro selection, Eric, do you know? McCaffrey? Stephon Gilmore. Wow, that's surprising. Well, I mean, McCaffrey did make history, making all the two positions. I was about to say McCaffrey. Go ahead, Jason. Yeah, I was going to point that out. McCaffrey got two positions um, running back on and the all pro. Yeah, so I mean that was pretty cool. Run CMC taking over. If only he had a quarterback. Anyway, <laughs> he's yet yeah, he still ran for nearly fourteen hundred yards and still caught over a hundred passes for over a thousand yards. Correct oh, me, boy, if, I, he had correct a quarterback. me if I'm. I'm going to set you up for a squid bit here, Eric. Correct me if I'm wrong. Only the second player in NFL history to do 1,000 and 1,000 in the same season? Third, actually. Can you tell us the other two? I used to I've, have them because I had them earlier, and they're on the tip of my you, I will give you an opportunity to look those up while Brandon tells us what he thinks is going to happen in Minnesota and New Orleans. Um. Quick question while you're looking those up, Eric. Would you count this as uh, one of those games that um, that Kirk Cousins would struggle in? Yes, because it is considered a standalone national yeah. broadcast. Okay. He doesn't have his famous 1 p.m. cover like he would in the regular season. Okay. So in spite of it being a 1 o'clock game, it is still a nationally broadcast game. And as we found out numerous times, Kirk Cousins seems to struggle in said games. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, between that and the Saints and and the Saints wanting revenge for the miracle in Minnesota, yeah, New Orleans is going to bitch slap them. The line is seven and a half. They're going to outscore them by more than seven and a half in each of the two halves. This is not going to be a close game. Drew Brees is out for blood after the way his team was screwed in the postseason last year. Michael Thomas. They were screwed going into the postseason this year. Mm -hmm. Michael Thomas is, I don't even think arguably at this point, the best receiver in the National Football League. Alvin Kamara Kamara has officially stamped his presence as one of the best running backs in the NFL, even though he no longer has Mark Ingram as his his side piece. This is a New Orleans Saints offense that is incredibly dangerous and a defense that is good enough to stop Minnesota as long as they can bottle up Dalvin Cook. A Dalvin Cook, I will point out, that is less than 100%, even after having sat out Minnesota's season finale last week against 
Chic- uh, Chicago, I think. Yes. Yep. No. Chicago. Yeah, Chicago. Yeah, like Chicago. A, game, a game that Minnesota lost, by the way. So they're coming in without any momentum as well. I'm going to take the Saints, and I'm going to take the Saints by – I'm even going to up it. I'm going to say at least three scores. I'm saying 17. So to answer the question, Marshall Falk and Roger Craig, those were the other two. To address the game at hand, I'm just going to keep this as simple as I can. I don't like that. I've never liked that. I'm not ever going to like that. If the Vikings can keep this with even within two touchdowns, I would be surprised. If the Vikings, even with Dalvin Cook, score 14 points, I will be surprised. Even though the Saints don't have good karma, because Teddy Bridgewater didn't get his 10th touchdown pass, which cost him a quarter mil, the revenge tour will continue for at least one more week. Um, I strongly disagree with what you just posted in the group chat, Jason, because mm-hmm. there ain't nothing hype about that kid. That dude is the real deal. Mm-hmm. Oh no, I'm just I'm just saying that it, it's for all us white crackers out there. Anywhere we we have the great white hype again. <laughs> and for those wondering, I officially identify as a saltine American. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you, Brandon, you the Sultan, because I thought I would wear the turban in that case. Hmm. Let's leave your personal shenanigans out of this, Eric. We have one <laughs> more match to get to. Brandon, <laughs> there is a road favorite in the wild card weekend of the postseason this year. Seattle goes to Philadelphia, and Seattle is a one and a half point favorite on the road. Can I ask you, why the hell is it not higher? (laughs) I mean, come on. This is an Eagles team that just barely inched their way into the playoffs in an an absolutely abysmal NFC East division. Fun fact, if they went by actual records and not by division— Philadelphia would not be in. They would have lost a tiebreaker to the Rams based on the head-to-head game that they played. Oh, and I'm sure the Rams wish that the NFL would go in the route of the NBA and just get rid of divisions and go completely off of conference. Technically, they haven't haven't done that yet. The current rule is a division leader cannot be ranked lower than the four seed. And if you're really going by reference, they would be going the route of a now defunct arena football league in the mid two thousands. However, when a division champion, the New York dragons missed the playoffs at nine and seven, the AFL quickly course corrected and went back to division champions getting automatic berths. Well, either way, there is not a chance in hell of the Eagles winning this game. You gotta go with the Seahawks on this one. Eric. Another hashtag squid bit. Carson Wentz, the first quarterback in NFL history to throw for over four thousand yards in a season without a single receiver getting five hundred yards during that season. I'm pretty sure if you took the two of us, two of the four of us, we could go ahead and make that team and at least be somewhat productive or at the very least make it through the entire game. If we happen to go into the injury tent, we would be getting in line behind the other 26 people on that team. All of this beast mode being back, And oh, by the way, Russell Wilson's record in the Eastern time zone after everything that happened week 17. No, it's not fly Eagles fly, but I can't think of anything more apt for this. But yeah, go Hawks. 
I will gladly stand on this island. Seattle is eleven and five. Yes, yes. which is admittedly impressive. Yes. Are you ready for a hairy fact here, Eric? All right, I'm listening. Seattle is eleven and five, and their plus minus on the season is only plus seven. Okay, well, that goes with them having, what, 10 one-possession games? The most since the NFL went to a 16-game schedule back in 78? That makes a lot of sense. That being said, it is a Seattle team that does know how to win close games, but a Seattle team that finds itself in situations that it should not find itself in by having all of these close games against teams that they shouldn't let stick around. I think if you let Philadelphia stick around, specifically Carson Wentz's flair for the dramatic, and the fact of the matter is, is we've talked about this before, division-winning teams with the worst record of any playoff team in their conference have won their last three wildcard weekend games. Fly. Eagles fly. Philadelphia. Ooh. If Carson Wentz does what Nick Foles did, hey, that would be better for everybody in Philadelphia. I'm just not saying he will. And besides, even with those with the worst records, if you look at those situations, those teams had a little bit of a decided advantage because, well, one of them. Carolina going up against Ryan Lindley. Come on now. Come come on. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but wasn't Russell Wilson and the Seahawks in a similar situation to the Eagles a few years ago? Or was that the Saints that was a team that, with the 9-7 record? Wait, are you talking about with the Beast Quake run? Yes. That wasn't Russell Wilson. That was Matt Hasselbeck, and Seattle was at home in seven and nine against the oh, okay. Rams. Mm-hmm. All right, Jason, you wrap us up. It is Seattle minus one and a half at Philadelphia. Uh, as the NFC East fan, I'm going to hate to take this, but I'm going to go with the Eagles. You got a West Coast team coming east. Uh, they're not going to be um, used to the environment. Philadelphia fans suck. They throw batteries at Santa Claus. Um, snowballs. And, they were snowballs and, at Santa Claus. Batteries at referees. And That's I'm going to point out some. You actually have Carson Wentz playing this game, unlike in the past where he's been watching it from the sidelines. And the Eagles have been led by a backup quarterback. Who is now a backup quarterback in Jacksonville, and probably Josh so, Jacksonville? So our collarbone injuries. As much as as much as I like, and I mean I really like Seattle. Uh, they have some questions at running back. Uh, yeah, they brought Lynch out of retirement and threw him back in the backfield, but. Yeah, I'm going to say that Philadelphia at home is going to be a little bit too much for the Seahawks to to deal with. Here's the thing about one thing you said that I disagree with is you mentioned the the time differential and them coming east. It's a 4 o'clock game, so it wouldn't really change anything for them in terms of their preparation, because it's the same as if they were playing a one o'clock game in Seattle. Do, do you know what the, again, do you know what the weather's going to be like? In, hold on, hold on. One at a time, please. Eric, go ahead and state your case here. Jason can respond. Yeah, Russell Wilson's record in the Eastern time zone. Isn't he something like 13 and 5? Not to mention he's never lost to the Eagles before, including playing in Philadelphia previously. 
Jason, your response. Uh, I'm just going to point out it's going to be cold and windy. Uh, you still have a West Coast pl- coming to the East Coast. So you do still have that time differential. You're going to see see that weather come into play. And like I said, you're going to see a Seattle team that will have to rely on a passing game, but with a windy stadium such as Philadelphia, you're going to see uh, a lot of passes that fall incomplete. And Wilson have one. Of, I'm going to predict Wilson has one of his worst playoff games of his career. So your state has so, never gotten cold and windy in different parts of the Big Ten, and that it never gets cold and windy in Seattle. Yeah, okay. really. Well, all I'm going to say to that is, fuck the Badgers, go Ducks. <laughs> Anywho, real quick, um, this is a revenge game for Philadelphia. And this is the last thing that I'm going to say on this, and then we'll go to wrap up the show here. These two teams actually met in Philadelphia earlier this season, a Seattle 17 to nine victory. It is very difficult as we've established on the show before to beat a team twice in the same place in a season. I think that Philadelphia is going to make the necessary adjustments and for as good of a coach as Pete Carroll is, I believe that Philadelphia will have a game plan to counteract Russell Wilson, to counteract and shut down Marshawn Lynch. And I believe that the Eagles will take this game. And I would not be surprised if it's by more than one score. Gentlemen, which of the four games are you looking forward to most? And then we'll get out of here. Eric. Titans, Patriots, because, oh, hell, this is going to be one of the few times where I will be dancing around my house like a jackass if the Titans win. Brandon. Um, I think, honestly, the game I'm looking forward to the most is Bill's Texans. I think um, if Josh Allen can keep his nerves in check, I think that will probably be the closest game. Uh, of the uh, four. Jason. Eagles, Seattle, simply because I love being right. I don't think you guys need to ask me. I think it's pretty apparent which game I'm looking forward to the most. Uh huh. Yeah. For the second it's time. That, it's that New Orleans <laughs> docking, isn't it? Absolutely. <laughs> I don't like it. I never liked it. I won't ever like it. Right, Eric? Exactly. Uh, For the second time in three years, Sean McDermott has the Buffalo Bills back in the postseason. And I said something in the group chat that I'm going to bring to the show here, and I'm going to make it get officially on the record for everybody listening. This Bills team is still a year or two away from being really, really good. Like AFC East home field advantage through the postseason good. It'll be the 90s all over again. Although Thanks. I can't wait to see Buffalo lose in a couple more Super Bowls. Well, I'd say the same about Jacksonville, but y'all would have to make one. Hey, if the referees had realized everything with Miles Jack being down, we would be in one already. Had it not been for a forward pass, we would have been in another one already. You assume you would have beaten Buffalo in 99. Shut the hell up. Um, I'm sorry. Have you not seen how the likes of winning in Buffalo against Jim Kelly and going up against Elway and all them in previous years? And lest we forget the Titans were the only team in the NFL that we lost to that season. Yeah, uh, we'd, we'd have a banner hanging up right now. I still think Buffalo could have beaten Jacksonville in 99. No, you would have come down here, and what happens to ice cubes when you take them out of the freezer? (laughs) Jason, where can people find you online? Nowhere. I fucking gave up on Twitter. Fuck everybody. Fuck your mama. Fuck your couch. Support pancakes. 
I don't need your follows. I don't want your follow. Oh, wait, I'm turning into Biggie. Sorry. You seriously gave up on Twitter? Pretty much, yeah. People pissed me off. I mean, it's not fantasy football season, so I really don't have nothing to talk about. Now, if I had that uh, fantasy football to the max, I'd have something to talk about on Twitter. But since that ain't happening... Well, it's still fantasy football season if you play with FanDuel. I'm in a contest this week right now. Set my lineup and everything. Hashtag more ways to win. Like I said, we can't be bought, but we can sure be rented. <laughs> Brandon, where can people find you online? Uh, they can find me online on Twitter at Bisco underscore Gotham SN. That may be changing soon, my uh, username. And if you're into uh, if you're into basketball, if you're a big basketball fan, uh, check out SHN Network on uh, on YouTube as I will be calling the number nine ranked and number thirteenth ranked, respectively, North Merrill Beach High School Chiefs as they get ready to face the Sockesty Braves on Tuesday. Uh, oh, sorry. Natural, <laughs> Wrong natural, Braves. Natural reaction to hearing Braves in the South. Sorry, I'm okay. Eric, where can people find you online? At Squid Sports Head on Twitter. If you slide into my DMs and are willing to undergo yeah, a vetting it. process, I will go ahead and grant you access to both my dark Twitter and my Telegram. What the fuck? Never mind. I don't want to know. I'm not even going to ask. Nope. Not worth it. Nope. I, I've learned from the past. As a Bills fan, those who do not learn from the past are doomed to repeat it. Exactly. You talk about playing Jacksonville 10-3. Just saying. How many times does Florida have to beat Miami for us to not have this conversation anymore? And didn't we just take one of your running backs too? We still have you in ice hockey. We still have you in ice hockey. They play hockey in Florida. I mean, the Panthers, I, I guess the Panthers don't suck anymore, but they did for the longest time. Anyway, hey, we got, hey, got the Lightning. Got the Cup finals back in 96. Got there before the Lightning, sorry asses, did. ATP the Eagle on Twitter, Harry Broadhurst on Facebook. Feel free to message me, talk sports, wrestling, whatever. I'm always open to people to talk to. would love to talk sports with anybody or whatever there. And every now and then I even watch AEW Dynamite and respond to Jason when he watches the show too. It, it takes me a little time sometimes, but I will do that. All right. Um, uh, Eric, why don't you go ahead and describe what's going to happen next week on the show? Well, I'm glad that you mentioned. See, there's a special number in my heart, a number that, well, we all associate with certain things, certain things that I've happened to perform multiple times throughout the course of my life, all with very positive results, if I may add. So, yes, for those loyal ones that have been counting and who paid attention at the beginning of the show, next week will be the 69th episode of The Kickoff. And I'm telling you right now, I got booze, I got condoms, and it ain't going to be a family show. <laughs> Shenanigans <I'm>... bound. <laughs> let's you trying to fuck? <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's be careful using the term bound around Eric, shall we? I mean, if you go online or go through the app to order from Wish.com, they have some great uh, sales on bondage restraints that you can use right on your bed. Very easy to set up, too. You, you set them up this time, Harry. <laughs> Seriously, viewer discretion strongly advised for next week's episode. For, <laughs> for Jason Teasley, Brandon Biscoping, and Eric Watkins, I'm Harry Broadhurst. This has been The Kickoff After Dark, a presentation of the W2M Network online at w2mnet.com. In addition, you can find us online on all of your favorite podcast services, iTunes, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, Spreaker, Podbean, Castbox. Hey, Brandon, guess what? Spotify is here.
And Mark Lamping is still a dick. Andrea Frisk on Periscope, OnlyFans.com slash GothBabe93. If you're feeling frisky, coming soon, potentially, to the W2M Network. Thanks for listening, everybody. We'll talk to you guys next week for episode 69. Oh, all right.